Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Open Bible. On well, this uh, Sunday morning, we're glad you joined us. Uh, services are getting ready to start inside. So, hey, let's go in together, and I'll get ready to uh, share God's Word with you. God bless you. Psalm 127, if you join me this morning, please. Psalm 127. Now, we're going to, are we baptizing? So we're going to baptize before this service is over. We're going to welcome three or four families into membership. We're going to have the Lord's Supper, and you're going to need a pulled pork sandwich when we're finished. And so I hope you stay for lunch. It's for free, and it's delicious. It's Bob Smith and Marion Smith favorite recipe, right? Bob? You couldn't hear me? It's your favorite recipe, right? You got all the spices and a secret recipe. He got it from Colonel Sanders down there in Kentucky years ago. So we're excited about it. Psalm 127. We've been talking a little bit, I guess this is the sixth week, on the family. And we, we kind of looked at for, uh, oh, I don't know, two, three weeks, we kind of looked at this thought, uh, when God builds the house. Remember that? <clears throat> and we said this, when God is involved in building your home, when you let God build your home, when you give God the place that he deserves in your home, when you surround your home around the Lord, when he's the hub of your home, then there are certain things that are visible. It's very visible that God's at work in your home, right? And we talked about things like leadership. There'll be leadership and submission, communication, forgiveness. There'll be love and security and, and the list goes on. Well, so when God is at work in the home, and by the way, God wants to work in your home, God desires to work in your home, but you got to let him work in your home. You got to allow him to be the Lord of your house. And you got to keep reminding yourself that he needs to be the Lord. He needs to take that rightful place in your home, right? And so when God builds the home, listen to this, this statement, it becomes a place of training. Did you get that? So when God is engaged and when God is working in our home, in our family, our home becomes a training center, you know, where our children are learning what they need to learn, where they're growing, where they need to grow, where they're experiencing what they need to experience, because the home not only uh, is to be a training center, but a launching pad. Did you get that? Yeah. And so uh, the home that God builds is a place where there's training and we're training. Our, and by the way, I believe this to be absolutely positively true. Our children train us. <laughs> oh, oh, man, if you if you uh, you know, if you're lacking in patience, you're not letting your children help you. And if you're not praying as much as you should, you're not letting your children help you because children are given to us to help us grow. And so it's a growing experience, you know, and, and so the home that God builds is a place of training. But it's also it's also a place of launching. You know, we need training in the church. You know what that's called? Discipleship. Right? People get saved, they come to church, and they need to be trained. We need to learn all that we need to learn about the Christian life, and we call that, we label that as discipleship. Well, there needs to be training in the home. Our children need training. You know what they call that? Parenting. Oh, that's a new word, I know. 21st century, what? You mean the kids aren't supposed to just have their way? Look at the kids saying, uh-huh. Yeah, pastor preach on that. Uh, and so, but it's called parenting, and that's what we're to do uh, as parents. And so, when God builds the home, it's a training center, but according to this text, it's also a launch pad. Look at verse 1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. It's vain for you to rise up early, sit up late, eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Look at verse 3 and 4 of my text. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Look at verse 4. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Right? You see that? That's the text. We're going to study that this morning. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. Full of what? Arrows or children. You see the connection there? So the Lord, the psalmist is comparing our children to arrows, arrows to our children. Happy is the man that hath this quiver, quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed. They shall speak with the enemies 
in the gate. Interesting text of scripture, isn't it? Verse number four, uh, arrows in the hand of a mighty man. You know this, I think you know this to be true. Arrows are designed to be launched, right? Isn't that right? Um, you, you don't keep them in your quiver. An arrow in the quiver does no good, kind of like a tithe in your wallet or in your purse or in your pocket. It does no good. See, I made that connection. That's pretty good, wasn't it? Huh? Uh, and, and so uh, arrows are designed to be launched. And so when God uh, is at work in the home, it's not only a place of training, but a place of launching. And I want you to notice here how the psalmist paints this picture for us. He, he begins to talk about children and he compares them to arrows. And if you think about it, you've got to really think about this to, to get the lesson, to get the connection. Uh, he talks about the mighty man. You see that in verse number four? As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man. We would say this, that mighty man is a hunter. Right? He's a hunter. Now, I'm not a hunter. I don't like to hunt. I like to fish. I like the outdoors, but I absolutely find no pleasure in standing in a cold tree, you know, waiting for a deer to come who may never come, just so I can say I went hunting. If I can hunt in 85 degree temperatures with a, you know, nice cold glass of sweet tea in my hand, I might be into it. But up here in the north, I find no pleasure in hunting. But I know you guys do, and I love you for it. Brother Ted's a great hunter. He loves to hunt, you know. But here's what a hunter does. According to this text, I want to kind of tie it together. Uh, I'm told a hunter prepares for the hunt. Is that right? Where's all the hunters? Bob's a hunter. You prepare for the hunt, you know. And I think sometimes the preparation is a little bit more fun than the actual hunt. <laughs> You know, you get all the goods together, man, and you got, you know, your warm gear. And I know Bob Fenton cheats. Puts, you know, he puts heaters in his deer stand and in his boots and in his gloves. Isn't that right, Cole? You know, and uh, but part of the preparation, part of the preparation is preparing your arrow, if you're bow and arrow hunting. And according to this text, they were. And so they're preparing they're preparing their arrows. And here's what I'm told they do, because I'm not a hunter. But I'm told what they do in preparation for those arrows is this. They make them sharp and balanced. Sharp, say with me, sharp and balanced. Sharp and balanced. And so get this text of scripture. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Do you see the connection? The psalmist is saying something like this. He's comparing uh, your children, my, our children, he's comparing to an arrow. And he talks about the mighty man, the hunter, and how he prepares his arrows. And the way he does that is by making sure they're sharp and balanced. Say sharp and balanced with me. Uh-huh. And we might say this, that's pretty good. That's pretty good instruction for a parent where we need to work in our home to make sure we're preparing our children to launch them out into this world. And the best preparation that we can make is to make sure our kids are sharp and balanced. I thought that was better than you let on. Sharp and balanced. In fact, we might say this, that might be the great commission of the home. To make sure we are doing our job as parents to make sure our kids are prepared to be launched out into this world. Sharp and balanced. You now you remember this, and I think Brother Ted alluded to this just a moment ago. Uh, the whole bottom line to life is this. Say, say this, Pastor, what's the bottom line to life? Only a couple people want to know that. Pastor, what's the bottom line to life? Here it is. Are you listening? To know God, to know God, to glorify God, and to enjoy God. You ought to write that down someplace. God's whole, the whole purpose of life is for you and I to come to know him and, and glorify him. Isn't that what you said just a little bit ago, Brother Ted, out of Psalm 61, verse 3? Glorify him and to enjoy him. God wants us to enjoy him. And I think this, if we can make sure that in life, whether it's church life or social life or work life or family life, we know him, glorify him, and enjoy him, 
Man, I'll tell you why. We are well on our way. Don't you agree? I believe so. I remember years ago uh, learning and then teaching what is called the three basic levels of life. I'm not sure if you've ever... Jason, you have that recorded in your Bible someplace? Jason's been under my ministry since he's been 19... Really, since you've been in what? Sixth grade? Seventh grade? Sixth, seventh grade. He started paying attention when he was about 30 to my preaching. Uh, But you might have this written in your Bible someplace. Uh, The three basic levels of life. And, and And I would say this. This is where most people... This is where most people live, in one of these levels. Can I share them with you real quick? Uh, The first level I call the survival level. The survival level. How many of us have been through the survival level? Would you raise your hand, wave it up and down, and clap and say, I'm glad I got past the survival level. If you're still there, we're praying for you. So what's the survival level? Uh, That's the level where you're just getting by in life. You're just getting by. Uh, you're struggling all the way. Huh? Uh, maybe some of the struggle is emotional, some physical, uh, some financial. Maybe you would say, a preacher, if you wanted me to really share my struggle, it's all of the above. It's physical, it's emotional, it's financial. I'm just struggling. In fact, we would say this mm, about the survival level. We're just keeping our head above water. Are you with me? Huh? Look here. Most people start out, most people start out at the survival level. I was joking around, I think on Wednesday night, I was doing a little Bible study here, Brother Ted. Uh, We're doing this study on no other gods. You know, I laid a foundation two weeks ago. Last week, we talked about the number one thing that we replace God with in society. It's money. Money. May not be for you, but if you did a, I mean, if you just took a consensus and looked at all the statistics out there, people allow money to be their God. And by the way, whatever you focus on, whatever you worship is what you focus on. And there's some people focused on money. <laughs> and I said this in the Bible study, because it's absolutely positively true, that when, I, when Anna and I were coming up, we were poor. I really mean, we were poor. When I went into the ministry, my first year in the ministry, I didn't have an income. I mean, we lived off of offerings, you know. I, I never forget going to the tax, uh, ta- tax season, having a church tax accountant come and, and did my taxes. And he said, this is impossible. I said, what? He said, you gave more than you made. I didn't have anything on record as far as uh, a W-2. Everything was just through offerings. You know, but I learned this. I can't live off of what they're giving me, so it'd be better for me to give something to God so that he makes up the shortfall. Hello? And I said this on Wednesday night, that when we were coming up, and I mean this, this is absolutely positive, we didn't qualify for poor. We were beyond the poverty level, you know? And and I'm not proud of it, but boy, did God teach me some unbelievable lessons. How to live from his hand to my mouth in the survival level. And so if you're in this survival level right now, don't fret, just trust God. Trust God, do right. And there's some good counsel I can give you on how to get through the survival level to what is the second level, which I would say is the success level. The success level. How would I define that? Well, uh, you're doing well. You're doing good. You might say, I'm out of the survival level. So I'm successful, I'm succeeding. And maybe we would, we would uh, maybe we'd agree and say we got it together. You know, finally got it together, right? Um, living with some values. I'm living by principle. Are you with me? Amen. Right? I, I'm, 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 I got some level of success going on in my life or in my family life. We've made certain preparations and they are paying off. I like that. We're no longer enduring life. We've, we've, be, we've began to enjoy life. That's what you do at the successful level. You're no longer enduring. You're not existing. Now you're living and you're enjoying and you're experiencing a whole new world outside of just surviving. Well, there's a third level. And I call this the significance level. The significance level. 
And this is where, and pay attention right here, this is where I wanted to get to, this is where we begin to make a difference. Say amen. amen. We begin to make a difference. We're not just living, it's not just about survival, it's not about climbing the ladder of success. No, now I'm living, I'm living for something else. I want to, I want to live a life that makes a difference. I want to be a difference maker. You got real quiet on me. I want to be, a di I want to make a difference. I'm not just here to live or to succeed. God has placed me here on purpose to make a difference. To make a difference. And that's where we begin to touch people in specific ways that we come in contact with. Huh? We begin to make a difference in the life of others. No longer living in a bubble. No longer consumed by, how am I, how am I going to make it till tomorrow? No longer consumed by, well, what's the next, you know, rung on the ladder? No, now, we're just saying, Lord, how can you use me to make a difference in somebody else's life? Amen. That's a whole different level of living. Amen? Amen. I, remember, I remember years ago, and it just, just dawned on me, and I just want to share it with you. It's got nothing to do with the message, or maybe it does. But there are some people who, man, they just start to climb the ladder of success, and they get to the top of the ladder, and all of a sudden it dawns on them, they had the ladder against the wrong wall. There's something in that. You ought to hide that someplace in your heart. Because most importantly for you and I as God's kids, and once you got saved, you became one, it's no longer, what do I want to do? Dad, what do you think I ought to do? Mom, what do you think we ought to do? No, God, what is it? What is it you have for me? What do you want me to do? And if it were up to me, I guarantee you, I'd have my ladder against the wrong wall. I'm ambitious enough, I'm industrious enough, I have a diligent work ethic, and so I think that I could succeed, but God forbid if I were to succeed in the wrong area of life. Amen. Yeah. i never forget this. You may not believe it, you might. I, I have pictures to prove it. I, pl I started playing ice hockey when I was in third grade. Those of you, Colin, sitting back here, Colin, you remember Ed Van Emp. You remember Andre Lacroix. These are flyers who played back in the day with Doug Favell. I was an absolute hockey freak. I mean, you, I slept hockey, ate hockey, you name hockey. I was hockey, hockey, hockey. So I started playing in third grade, organized ice hockey in Brookhaven, Pennsylvania, and my coaches, the people who owned the school that I went to was, was Ed Van Imp and Andre Lacroix. They were Philadelphia Flyers. And man, I just started to play and play and play. And I mean, by the time I was in sixth grade, I was really advancing. Time I was in high school, I was playing for three teams, kind of like you play for a travel team, Cole, in baseball. I was playing for a travel team in ice hockey. I was playing for my high school, which was, don't hold this against me, West Catholic High School for Boys. You know where Mrs. Yanizzi went? West Catholic High School for Girls. We met in, oh, I don't know, 10th or 11th grade. She fell in love with me and convinced me to love her, and we got... <laughs> Just making sure you're paying attention. I played for, pay attention now, I played for my, my, my uh, uh, high school. I played for the team in Brookhaven, which was the club team. And then I played for the Junior Firebirds. Remember the Philadelphia Firebirds? Colin, you remember the Philadelphia Firebirds played at the Civic Center. I played for their junior team, which took me to Canada. And so between the ages of 18 to 18 and a half, almost 19, I was playing organized ice hockey. I played on the same ice with some of my heroes, like Bobby Orr. Bobby Orr, I got a picture with him. And Daryl Sittler and Reggie Leach of the Flyers, and Rick McLeish, and I can go on and on and on. I mean to tell you, it was amazing. And then when I was getting ready to graduate high school, for I don't know why, but for some reason, I started to lose my intensity. I started to lose my drive. 
And when I was playing, I was always scoring goals. In fact, you may not believe this, but I promise you it's true. When we played one game against Bishop Newman, which is a high school in Phil- it used to be in Philadelphia, I made it into their yearbook because I scored five goals in one night against them. And they put me in their yearbook. I had to go sign all their yearbooks at the end of the year. But I, all of a sudden, I just lost, uh, I just lost it. And, and I don't know why. And so I graduated high school in, in June. That November, I got saved. I graduated in June, November, I got saved. And I didn't know this. I didn't know this, but God had a call upon my life to be a preacher. If you'd have known me then, you would have said, no way, hockey player, maybe, preacher, never. My ladder was against the wrong wall. I'm just glad that somehow, some way, and I think it was through the prayers of my parents, my mother especially, and my grandmother, and my uncle who became my pastor, it was through their prayers that God began to work in my mind and in my heart and changed everything. I got saved in November, and by that spring, I thought I was losing my mind. Because everything that I liked and enjoyed, I no longer liked and enjoyed. And and I didn't know what to do. And so I went to this small little independent Baptist church, and they told me what to do. And it wasn't long after that, maybe two years after that, Brother Riddell, that I was sitting in an evening service. A missionary came in, preaching out of Isaiah chapter number um, uh, 6 where, you know, who will go for us, who shall we send, who will go for us. I was sitting right where about you were at, uh, Ranji, and, and the preacher wasn't some really exciting, bombastic preacher like Dr. Riddell. He, he was just monotone, just reading his message, you know. And I mean to tell you, when I was paying strict attention, and all of a sudden at the end of the service, God got a hold of my heart, and he said something, and he didn't even shout, out, who will go? He just said, so who's going to go? And in my heart, I remember saying, I'll go. I'll go. And then the next thing the, the, uh, the missionary said is, uh, if, you, if you're willing to go, would you come forward? And I couldn't believe this, but I got up and started walking forward. The whole way down the aisle, I was saying, where are you going, man? Where are you going? And I, I never forget, I came down and knelt right there. My pastor was out of town. And I knelt right there and I said, I don't even know what to say. I just said, I'll go. I don't know where. I don't even know why. And I don't want to. But I'll go. And that started everything. And now, almost 40 years later, almost 40 years later, I've been in the ministry. 35 of it pastoring people like you, which has been a a wonderful experience. (laughs) Had had to get it out. It's not all pastoring is... There's no job in the world that's like pastoring, the ups and the downs, the ebbs and the flows. Dr. Riddell will tell you that. But I learned to live in that last level, the significance level, where I've traded in success for an opportunity to make a difference. And Don and I said a long time ago, we want to live our lives to make a difference in other people. It costs a great deal. It does, but there's really no exchange. There's, there's nothing you would trade it for when God uses you to make a difference in somebody else's life. And that's where this text, the psalmist is saying, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so, children, uh, so are children of the youth. In other words, what he's saying is this. We need to prepare our children for success Pay attention right here. No, no, no. Success. Look here. If I'd have made, if I'd have made it into the NHL, if I'd have made it into maybe the, uh, you know, the area of minors where I, I was getting paid, I think farm team. What do they make? What's a farm team baseball player make? Forty grand a year, right? With hopes to maybe make it. I, I would have never made it because I stopped growing. And everybody else kept growing, and I was getting killed. I was really fast. I was like Kenny Lintzman. Colin, you remember Kenny Lintzman? You know, you don't remember Kenny Lintzman? He was a flyer, number 26. He was a great player. Who remembers Kenny Lintzman? Come on, man. He was my idol because he was the same height as me and he was in the NHL. You know, nobody else mattered to me then. 
you know, but I've had stitches over here, I've had stitches over here, I've had a cracked tooth, I've had, you name it, playing ice hockey, I got it. And I just realized after the fact that I'd have never made it. My ladder was against the wrong wall. I'm so glad that at an early age, I listened to the Lord and did what he wanted me to do. Does that mean everybody needs to be a preacher? Everybody? No, 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 no. No, you can, be, you can live at the level of significance in whatever, because we need difference makers who are dentists. So that way when preachers come, you can give us a discount. <laughs> uh, and I'm getting old enough where I need a Christian heart surgeon. <laughs> right? And so I love it when somebody says, hey, uh, go, to, go to my doctor. He's a Christian. Praise the Lord. <laughs> All I'm thinking about is I'm going to get a discount. Huh? And we need Christian lawyers. I know that seems like an oxymoron. Can a Christian really be a lawyer? Oh, yeah. And we, we need them because every once in a while we get into some kind of a legal tangle. However, however, whatever you are, whatever you're aiming to be or do, live at the level of significance. Amen? Three levels of life. And so let me just do this in closing. Let me just maybe define for us what it means to have children or to train children or to prepare children to launch in this world. What does it mean to be sharp and balanced? Let, let's talk about that for a moment. Let's talk about, let's talk about that, that idea of sharp. You know, to sharpen an arrow or a knife or a child, for that matter, it takes precision. It takes precision. You know, you go to get your knives sharpened, the person who's sharpening those knives knows what they're doing. It takes precision. And, uh, and they need to know what they're trying to, they have, a, they have an end goal in mind. And so if you and I, we're going to sharpen our children, what, what does that mean? How do we prepare them for life? And so here's what we're doing. Pay attention right here. We are honing their personality. Huh? You can go flip that, guys. I'm not sure what you're waiting for there. Uh, we need to hone their personality. I'm looking right here. You got these two boys right here. You got, you have, uh, you have, uh, forgot your name, and Ty. Clay, I'm sorry. I was just going to call you, for, I was going to call you something else for, for a second. And I was going to call you Cole because he's been on my mind. So you have Clay and you have Ty. How, what's the age difference here? 18. Who? 18 and 10. 18 and 10. That's pretty good. 18 and 12. Whoa, man, that's a big mistake. Charge, charge him a bag of Doritos for that. These boys, I mean, these boys are, are vastly different. And here's what Tyler and Carrie will tell you, that they, they, they each have, even though they're brothers and they love the Lord, these are two of the finest young men I've ever met, and I mean that. But they each have their unique personalities, right? They're, they're unique, and they have some similarities, but they're unique. And so what you have to do, what we have to do as parents, is we have to, we have to hone the personality of the child. We don't, make, we don't want to make little minor robots. Huh? Right? I, I don't want, look here, there are, there's a time, are you paying attention? Have I bored you already? Have I run you off? Have I worn you out? You okay? I got a couple more minutes left. I, my clock goes off, they wave everything up there and they say, shut up, it's done, it's enough. But not yet. Uh, there's a time when our children live our beliefs because they haven't developed their own. There's a time, now pay attention to this, there's a time when our children live our convictions because they haven't developed their own. But it would be a sad thing, Clay, you're 12. It would be a sad thing if all brother and Mrs. Austin tried to do was to push their convictions down his throat so that one day he'll just do what he's supposed to do because they do it. The best thing for them to do is to teach Clay why they believe like they believe, why they've made decisions that they've made, why they live by a certain standard. So that way, maybe when he gets old enough, he can say for himself, boy, that's good, I need to do the same thing. Rather than, well, I've always had to do this because my parents wanted me to, but I'm not even sure if it's right or wrong because I don't even know why they live that way. Say amen right there, please. Because that's good preaching. I don't care what church you go to, that's good preaching. 
And that's where we've messed up. And that's why some of our kids, they raise up and they want nothing to do with our Christianity. You know why? Because all we've done is forced it down their throat and we've not taught them why we don't go to certain places. Why we don't listen to certain things. Why we don't do certain things. It's just don't you do it. Don't you do it. Don't you do it. God forbid if you do it, you're going to mar the family name. Hello? And so we need to hone their unique personality. Because even though these boys raising up in the same home, same Bible, same church, all that stuff, they're unique. They have unique likenesses and dislikes. And Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. And part of that honing is this. Oh, man, is this important. We need to remember to teach our kids good manners. Where in the world has manners gone? Oh, Pastor, it's 2023. So you can't say thank you? You can't say please? You can't say yes, sir, and no, sir, and yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, and can I hold the door for you? Do you need help with that bag? No, I'll, I'll, I'll guide my wife to the car. Oh. You missed that. You didn't get it. Huh? What, what, what happened to the manners? I'll tell you what happened. We stopped, we stopped teaching our children the practice of good manners. And I know what we say, man. We like to look at society and say, oh, these kids are raising up and they're just entitled. You know why they're entitled? Because we've convinced them that they're so stinking special. We give them awards now just for participating. I like what Mr. Storr said, the graduation the other night. There's no such thing as a participation award here. It's either win or lose. That's life. We've tried to water it down and dummy it down. And now we got kids that, God forbid, if they get their feelings hurt or they don't get their way or they don't start the game. Come on, help me here, church. We need to teach them good manners. We need to teach them proper values. There's something more important than that iPhone they have in their pocket. Something more important than that, that gaming control they have in their hand. Hello? Something more important than that little girl they like in eighth grade. Amen. Come on, I'm having fun. You're not. <laughs> Something more important than that. We need to teach our kids that. Where do you think they're going to learn it? Their peers aren't going to teach them. Yeah. Huh? They're not going to get it at school. Yeah. We, need to we, we need to help them develop character. Huh? Your kids have chores to do around the house? And if they don't do them, you do them? What's going to happen when they get their first job and, and, and Mr. Chick-fil-A says, hey, now, before you leave, you got to wipe this, wipe that, wipe this, wipe that. And they leave. Guess what happens when they come in the next day? That's noted because the manager had to do it. How many times do you think the manager is going to do it before he gets fired or she gets fired? And then you know what you're going to do? You're going to go to Mr. Chick-fil-A and say, why did you fire my little boy or my little girl? They're so special. This is what you get after having me a pastor as a year. <laughs> I digress. Yeah. Can I, can I share this one thought? We need to hold them accountable. We need to hold our kids accountable. We need to hold them accountable. See, we want to launch sharp children into this world because we want our kids to be difference makers, right? But also we want them to be balanced. Correct? Balanced. Uh, if you were to define balance, here, here's a good working definition. Balance is an even distribution that, pro that produces a steady level of outcome. I didn't say income, I said outcome. Let me give it to one more time. Balance. We talk all the time. Man, we want to have a balanced ministry here at Open Bible. We want to have balanced family life. I want to have balance in my life. What are we talking about? Balance is an even distribution that produces a steady level outcome. Right? So you're not too much here, you're not too much there. I mean, you're just, just, just plowing ahead, very steady, even distribution. Right? It's kind of like when you worship God, you got to worship God in, uh, in spirit and in 
truth. What is that? That's perfect balance. If you have too much truth, you have legalism. If you have too much spirit, you have emotionalism. But you put the two together and you got worship. Did you get that? Balance. And we want our kids to be bound. We want them to be level-headed and steady in their deportment. Isn't that right? Huh? Level-headed and steady in their deportment. We don't want them to be all over the place. I don't expect. Look here. If I had to say to Cole, uh, Cole, what do you believe about this? Well, bless God, Pastor, I got a deep-rooted conviction. He's 12 years old. The only thing he's got deep-rooted in his heart is the love for Doritos. You like Doritos, right? Huh? Are you with me? I'm sorry, Clay. I called you Cole again, didn't I? <laughs> sorry, Cole. Are you with me? Man, alive. We got to do better at this. And by the way, this is a learned quality. It's important to teach balance in all areas of life. Physical life. You know what we teach our kids? Proper eating habits. <whistles> Exercise. Work. Rest. I lost you. Physical life. Uh, financial. We need to teach our kids financial per- earnings and spendings. Huh? Savings and debt. Where are they going to learn that at? First year of college? Too late. They've already got a credit card in debt. Relationship life with family and friends. Are you with me? Spiritual life. With the word and the spirit and church and service. It's our job, right? Yeah. And so as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. In other words, we need to do our job to make sure that we are preparing them to launch them into a world that's difficult. And have them make a difference. Have them become Watch, I'm I'm closing it. You like that? Have them become difference makers. Difference makers. You know where it begins? Here's where it begins. It begins when you and I allow God to be the Lord of our home. Right? And that doesn't mean your kids walk in, take their shoes off, bless themselves and fall down and worship and sacrifice. No, it means your, your house is a, just a safe zone. It's a safe zone. It's a happy place. It's an oasis, right? And your kids ought to run. That Your house ought to be the place where they want their friends to come to. Hello? God building the home. And here's the truth of it. It begins with salvation, where we make it easy for our kids to get saved. Are you with me? We'll make it easy for them to get saved. How how do you do that? By being genuine. So that your kids will want what you have. So when you share the gospel with them, it's not going to be, why would I want that? It hasn't changed your life. Right? Family altar, always asking your kids, are you 100% sure you're saved? And knowing that if they say I'm not, they're not going to get punished. Oh, you bless God, but that's what you said to the pastor. We already seen you get baptized. What do we do now? So now you have a kid that grows up without salvation, dies and goes to hell. Why? Because of your pride. Trying to help you, church. This is my last message on the family. Trying to help us. Man, my son, daughter, whoever it might be, one of my granddaughters, grandsons comes along and says, you know what, I, I don't know if I really was sincere. Well, bless God, let's get sincere right now. No skin off my back. I don't want to see my loved one die and go to hell because of my pride. Well, we can't tell Pop. He's going to be upset. Really? I hope you don't think that way. Huh? One of my deacons wants to get saved. Bob, if you finally decide to get saved, it's okay with me. (laughs) Right, Bobby Joe? I mean, we've, we've, right or wrong, we've become just so prideful. We don't want to upset anybody, but at our own risk of loss. And so it begins with salvation, it continues with likeness. So now we become more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Earlier this morning, I was praying and reading. The Lord spoke to my heart about something, I tweeted it out. It said something like this. I think I said something like this. The way we treat others 
is a reflection of our likeness to Christ. Uh, think about that. The way we treat others is a reflection of our likeness to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's some truth in that. John 13, 35 said this, they'll know you're my followers, you're my disciples by your care, your love one for another. So it begins with salvation, but it continues with likeness. And I would hope that more and more our home becomes like the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Hey, so thank you for joining us today. Sure hope you enjoyed the message. Hope you enjoyed the service. If you're ever in the area, we'd love to have you visit with us personally. Our address here at Open Bible is 1073 New Brooklyn Road, in Williamstown, New Jersey, 08094. And if you just want to give us a call, you know we're here to serve. And so if you have a prayer request or if you want to chat with us, maybe even about the message today and, uh, and or just about anything, maybe you're struggling with something in life and you need some biblical counseling, we're here to serve. Our phone number is 856-629-629. 3800. And again, you can call at any time. Well, the most important thing of all is having that personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we'd love to chat with you about that if you've not made a decision yet to trust Christ as your personal Savior. Well, you have a great week and hope to have you join us again here at Open Bible. God bless you.